Thank you. Let me, let me open this time up with a, a slogan that I use, and I want you to know that right now, in this part of my life, I feel um, uh, absolutely fulfilled in the sense that I feel that I'm struggling to do right now in this time in my life exactly what I have sort of always wanted to do for the Lord and what I, I feel like that I'm doing it right now in my life. And that's a sort of a release and a good feeling that I have. And I'm really delighted to be here. But one of the things that I, and I'm speaking to groups all over the country, and I'm speaking in, uh, to large groups, uh, uh, governor's prayer breakfast, mayor's prayer breakfast, business executives, and other folks are putting this on, and I'm getting the privilege of just going there, speaking at the largest congregation um, in, a, in, in, in the country. Uh, uh, the, in fact, the largest church in the United States, I'll be speaking there for a few days in just a few weeks. And I'm doing this all the time, so I'm doing exactly what I feel that God saved a third grade dropout to do. I feel like I'm doing now exactly what God called me to do. Amen. One of the things that I say when I go out and speak at these uh, congregations, I will say that uh, some people, you know, we are, we are at the threshold of a renewal in this country. Uh, we're at this threshold of us realizing that we need a renewal all the way through. We're at the threshold of that. And, uh, and, and, uh, and when I go out, and, and so some, some people are, is always trying to go back to some day when the country was okay. <laughs> you, you, you know, and they'll say things like, let's go back to the religion of our founding fathers. And I said, I don't want to go back there. I'd be a slave. <laughs> I said, why don't we go back to the Bible? Why don't we go back to the Bible and let's try to understand what Jesus meant when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what we want to do and what we want Christian community development to be, we want to be people that is acting out of the word of God. We are people who are connected and we recognize that we was created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're not just doing these good works even because there's social problems. We're doing these good works because God has called us to do good works. Let your light so shine before the world that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. And this is not works in order to get to heaven. This is not works for salvation. This is works in obedience to what Jesus has called us to. And so we want to go back and we want to learn how to do it. That's the purpose of the Bible. The Bible says uh, the scripture is given so that the men, people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is more than just worshiping God, and that's important. We need to admire him. We need to worship him. And I like that new slogan that we picked up this year. We always pick up that someday we're going to be able to kiss the neck of Jesus. Isn't that going to be wonderful? And that we can worship him now, and that we can worship him. And he calls us to worship him. And he calls us to symbolize ourselves together to worship him. But that's not the end. Jesus called us to be his workmanship to do his will. And we ought to consider ourselves really thrilled and honored that we can actually do the will of God, that we can participate in doing the will of God. And so we want that will of God, though, to be anchored in the word of God. We want to be working in obedience to what God has said and what God has called us to do and to be. And so open your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 27. You should bring your Bibles. This is a Bible study. Anyway, this, is, this is not an exercise this morning in preaching. This, we're here this morning to study the Bible. Okay, Genesis... 37. Let me read it and then I'll tell you what I'm going to do here this morning. Genesis chapter 37 beginning at verse 1. Genesis chapter 37. While you're finding that, then let me give you the backup for it. 
what we're going to do here this morning. Uh, from the time CCDA closes every year, Gordon and I start the process of getting ready for the next convention time together. We started talking about it. We usually have a retreat together. We do the evaluation that you give us and we, we hear that. One of the things we hear that the first night of the convention should not go after t oh, 10 o'clock. And last night we were doing all we could to get you out by 9.30. We, we missed it, but that's one of the evaluations. So we go over the evaluation and then we look and, we, and I start then to, to planning my talks that I'm going to do for the next year. And I started planning those talks in relationship to the need that we see and we hear and what's going on in the society. And so then I began my study and I began to prepare my talks for the coming year. What we did this year, we thought that we would talk about integrity, vulnerability, and brokenness. And so then I arranged my talks so that I could deal with each one of those subjects. And then what I want to do then is go to the Word of God, look into the Word of God, find the precedence in the Word of God, and then uh, find then the character. Uh, you see, the characters in the Bible, some of those are, uh, they are shadows of Jesus. Jesus is, is, our, is God and he's the one that we're patting our life after. We're the one, he's the one that we're following. But he also calls people and make those people role models and he projects them up that we can look at them and we can take the virtues out of their lives and apply them to our lives and then we can be more like Jesus. And so I began to look at the image, the model, who would be the role model we would lift out of the scripture. And then we looked at it and, we, and I said, ah, for integrity, for integrity, I said, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. And so this morning, as we study, and you can go on back home and study even after this, uh, the life of Joseph. Now this is the one person in the scripture, there are, well there's two in scripture, that you can find absolutely no blemish in their life. Not one. And that's Joseph and Daniel. Are two in the scripture that there is no blemish. You know David, the great king, the one who Jesus is going to sit on his throne when he comes to reign and to rule. David was the great king. Never a king like David. Never will be another king like David. Although Jesus will sit on David's throne, he is now the king of kings. But David was the greatest human king. But we don't know that David had blemishes on him. Right. But here we have a character we're going to look at this morning. As far as humanly possible, we can't see any blemish. I know he was a sinner just like you and me, and I'm sure he made mistakes like you and me, but God wanted to project him as one that we could emulate in life. Amen. That if we wanted to have integrity, we could look at a person of integrity, and we could shape our life after that person. And so this morning, we're going to look at the life of, of, our, of our Joseph as we look at integrity. Tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to look then at the guy who is vulnerable. Who is the guy vulnerable? And we need to be vulnerable. We need to expose ourselves. We need to take risks for God. We don't need to be conservative in everything. We need to be conservative in our theology. We need to be liberal in our opportunities. And we need to make risks and take a chance in life. And that was this great man. When I think of him, he almost brings tears to my eyes. And that's Elijah. We're going to look at one who was willing to confront the society and turn the society around. And Elijah turned the people back to God. Single-handed, he turned the people back to God. And so we're going to look at him as one was vulnerable. We're going to see him running. We're going to see him in cave. We're going to see him as a person just like us with all of the anxieties we have. But we're going to see one who stood up and turned the nation back to God. And then on the next morning, we're going to look at brokenness. And that morning, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul. God broke that bigot on that Damascus road. 
God broke him on that Damascus Road, and he broke him with his love. He embraced him with his love, and he broke him with love. And the apostle could never get over the fact that God laid hold of him on the Damascus Road, and he could say in Philippians that I may lay hold of him the way he laid hold of me. And so we're going to look at that. And so that's going to be our lesson that we're going to look at as we go. Now this morning, we want to go and look at this person of integrity, of integrity. Now, we're talking about leadership for today. Uh, God is a leadership God. God is not a consensus God. God don't go around and get consensus. God don't take polls. God, God don't see what people, th care what people think. God is a leadership God. And, and God don't usually, now, we are here this morning, but God don't usually himself, God don't usually speak to groups. God speaks to individuals. And he nurtures those individuals. Then he gives those individuals vision. And then those individuals are to share the vision with the other people. People are always like sheep without shepherds. And people always need a shepherd. And so God speaks in the ears of leaders and gives them a vision. And they walk in humility and then share that vision with others. And people are chained and violent. And so we're going to look at that uh, this morning, the kind of leaders we need. And so we need leaders with vision. We need leaders with big vision. Big vision. We're going to see this morning what made Jake, Joke, Joseph such a great man. Is that from the time he was a little boy, he had this vision for his life. He had this vision for a nation. He had this vision to save the whole world. And so you need a vision. And the Bible says without a vision, the people perish. And so we need leaders today with a vision. With a vision. You know, I meet some, meet some people. And in and, 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 and time you try to say something about the future, they start telling you about all the problems that's related to it and just sort of kill your spirit. You know, intelligent is to solve problems. And I make an assumption out there that there's problems. And so I want people to gather around me with the intelligent and let's take on the problem. Send us the problem and let's solve them. Don't tell me about the problem. Let's solve the problem. And so we're going to see, we're going to see this morning that this guy had nothing but problem. Nothing but problem. But those problems is what's going to make him strong. Right. It's going to be in the midst of those problems that he's going to be able to interpret vision. And it's through the problems of life that we grow. Pain, pain and suffering is not a negative. Suffering in the Bible is a virtue. People think more creatively in pain. And so we need to uh, take on pain. Take on pain. It is in suffering we get redemption. It is in suffering and pain is redemption in life. And so let's look then at leaders. Just for a few minutes then, let's look for a minute. Let's look at what are the ingredients, the basic ingredients in going to leadership. What are the three most important elements in leadership? Uh, assuming that you've got to have vision. That's a given. Vision is a, is a given. Without a vision, the people perish. And so the leader is a person who explains vision and shares the vision that came from God. Now we take that for granted. But what are the three most important ingredients as we try to implement that vision in life? There's three. Energy, intelligence, and character. Energy, intelligence, and character. All problems are solved. All problems are solved by energy management. Energy management. You put energy, and the best energy is human energy. Mm -hmm. Because intelligence is a part of human energy, or ought to be a part of human energy. So the first one is energy. The second one is, in, is intelligent. And the third one is character. Energy is the ability and emotion to act. Any great leader has a great amount of enthusiasm, has a great amount of energy. 
And so leaders learn how to manage their own energy and direct their energy toward the problem that they are seeking to solve. First one is energy. The second one is intelligent. Intelligent. That's it. You know, today, the people of the church with the energy, and I praise God for that church. And I praise God that God has brought the Holy Spirit and he has used that church, the charismatic church. He has used it to, to show us the Holy Spirit and we can see the Holy Spirit at work within the charismatic church. The weakness of that, though, they haven't wrapped enough intelligence around it. <laughs> They're acting more out of emotion instead of wrapping some intelligence around that emotion. And so God wants us to be people of intelligence because he is the source of wisdom. A wisdom. So we need the Holy Spirit in the church. We need the charismatic church. We need the Pentecostal church. We, the wonderful spirit is there. But we now have got to bring intelligence around that. And so it can be guided by intelligence, so it can be effective in the neighborhood and in the community. And the third one, of course, is, is character. Character is that which reproduces itself. Character is that which people see in you. Character is when uh, the bulls uh, are losing by 10 points and they bring Michael Jordan on. And his very behavior depicts character. We saw it again this year in baseball, and thank God for that. We saw it in Big Mac, but we also saw it in Sosa. I liked it when he would say to Big Mac, you are the man. And I liked it when Big Mac would say, you are the man. And while they was encouraging each other, we saw again character, character and integrity. That's what we want to get to here this morning. We want to look at it. This is what God needs, and we got the background to paint it over. All of us know that our whole nation have a character deficiency. We know that in our society. We know all the whole world. Uh, even Borweski, uh, Yeski, uh, he can't stay sober. You, you know, while our president can't keep his pants up, uh, he, this guy can't stay sober. So the greatest leaders in the world got character defic deficiency. And so this is a great time. This is a great time for us as the people of God to display that character. Now the idea of, the idea of discipleship was to shape our character. I don't know what y'all thought discipleship was all about. I hear all of this stuff today about I'm in some kind of discipleship group and people are living like clowns. <laughs> the idea of discipleship is to shape our character so that our lives, just by living them, can be impactful in the lives of others. We need to be able to say to others, follow me as I follow Christ. You ought to always be telling them about where you came from, you should always be telling them about the, the deficiencies in your life that you're trying to collect, correct, but say to people after that, man, I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with trying to be what God has called me to be. I'm a disciple. Jesus says, follow me, and I will shape your character. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men and women. And so that's what discipleship is all about. So now let's go then and look at our leader this morning that we want to model out uh, for, our, for the time we have here. Let's look and let's meet our person this morning, our leader. We understand where we're going now. We understand leadership. We understand we're looking now, we're going to look now for integrity in this person. And let's look at a little bit how this integrity came in his own life and what's important in a person's life for this integrity to grow and to develop. Look what it says now. It says now in verse 1, it says, And Jacob, and y'all know who Jacob was. He was the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of, of uh, Abraham. And Abraham was the Assyrian that God called out of Assyria and made a Hebrew to become the father of a nation. Y'all understand that. God made him a nation. And he took an Assyrian and made him that Hebrew, you understand that. And so, and then he called this man Jacob, 
you know, he made him the, 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 the son that would produce the 12 sons. Really, he produced 12, but actually we're going to see that Jacob, Joseph here is going to have two of the tribes because of his commitment to God and because of his love for God. God then gives him Jacob, Joseph's name is the name of two tribes, while Joseph himself don't have a tribe. What we have there is uh, in there, I think it's uh, Manasseh and Benjamin, they become the tribes. Those are the sons of Joseph in the Bible. So you got that. That's a little historical background to what we are getting in, what we're getting in at here. So Jacob dwell in the land where his father was a stranger in that land. Now let, look here. This is, I'm going to say this right quickly. That God calls us to always be a pilgrimage people. We are not to adjust ourselves to this world. We have to be a pilgrimage people. We have to be more than Democrats and Republicans and communists and liberals. We have to be God's witnessing force in the world. We are called to be pilgrims. And if you so overcommit yourself to any one of those world ideologies, you have conformed to the world and you can't be the kind of witness that God wants us to be in society. And so don't come to me tell them, okay, I want everybody to vote. I want everybody to, be a, to participate in the political process. But don't overtie yourself to one of these political parties thinking that, that black folks have done that and they can't even condemn Clinton and his stuff. I mean, that's one group of people black Clinton, Clinton have. It's all these black folks that gather around him and ain't say, saying nothing to me. Well, he has been a fairly good administrative president, but I want you to know that his moral character is not that that you want your grandchildren to eliminate, to, 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 to imitate in life. And so that we all, we as Christians, while we need to talk about the good that's in people, we also need to talk about those deficiencies in their life. And that we shouldn't be so engrossed into the Democratic Party that we can't hold that party accountable. And that's where our black leadership is at. And it ain't no sense in us talking about. I'm telling you, I, I have always been somewhat, I would never really uh, too easily to condemn uh, Clarence Thomas. But I want you to know that it is a scam. It is a scam that he don't have but one or two black clerks and he got that position to represent black people. That's right. That's a scam. And to say you can't find yeah. uh, eight or ten black lawyers who could write those briefs for him is a scam. What he's done, he's overbought into conservatism. Yeah, I want you to understand that. Just like most of our other blacks have overbought into the Democratic Party. Yeah. And so don't get too overbought in those. We are pilgrims. We are pilgrim people. We, we live in a land and we witness by the way we live to the nations around us. And that's what Jacob was here. Jacob was a pilgrim in the land. He was a pilgrim. And we're going to find that Joseph is going to be a pilgrim in the land. And wherever he goes out as a pilgrim, he's going to be able to witness to the glory of God. He's not going to oversell himself out to the system that he can't be a witness to the glory of God. And so we as people, CCDA, yes, I know a lot of us are going to be getting government grants now. They're making all that possible for us. Don't sell yourself out to this system. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we look for the Savior. Let's use this system. Let's use the system, but let's don't sell our soul to this system. And this is Jacob. Let's continue here with Jacob. It says here, and he said, these are the generation. It's important that you see that, that Jacob dwell in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generation of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, when he began to become this great, great leader. So God uses young people. 
Now, something had already went into Jacob's life, Joseph's life, before I mean 17. Look what it says here about it here. Hear him here, here about Jacob. It says that um, Jacob, being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks of his, of his brothers, brethren, and the lad was with the sons of his uh, Beliah and the sons of Zippah. That's, uh, those are the maids that, that, that gave birth for um, Rebecca, was it? For for, for, um, for, for, for Jacob. Now, for Rachel, excuse me, for Rachel. Those are the children who made birth for her. Now, look what it says here. And Joseph brought, his, brought unto his father their evil report. Even from a little boy, this guy had a good vision of what's right and wrong. And he told his father how his brothers behave in the world. So he had been raised by his father and by his mother, and that's so important. The father's import in shaping character is unmeasurable. I want you to understand that. I go to prison, and as I go to prison, I discover that 80% of the kids who are in prison grow up without a father in their home. Most of the criminologists and sociologists understand that one of the greatest problems we have in our society today is the fact that the family is so fragile. That's why the church needs to be so strong in terms of shaping families. I heard it last night when this brother said, boy, it thrilled my heart when he said 30% of our congregation are men. Yes. In particular, when we said 30% of our, our congregation are black men. And I want you to know that we have some strong black men in the black community. You're going to see two of those this morning as I finish here today. And so let's look then at this guy. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other children. It is so important that a child have the love of his father. That's the strength. That's the strength. That's the dynamics. I raised eight children, and I listened to my eight children. I listened to them. Now, I cannot undermine Vera May's love. For the, the children love Vera May more than they love me. I, for these 40-some years since we've been married, I've always tried to get the children to love me more. <laughs> meet with them and I meet with them all the time and we conspire. We get together and we carry on conversation about mama. <laughs> you, you, you know, and I do all the kind of conspiring I can to get them to love me more, but they love her the most. <laughs> and so the mother's love is there to give to the children the straight certain of love. Mother's love is deep. But in order for the character to be shaped, so the young folk can have the discipline and the stamina they need for life. They need a man in their life. They need the greatest pull that a child have is a desire to get accepted by their father. M most of my friends that are wealthy people, all of them were seeking, and even in making their wealth, to please their father. To please their father. The father's love is a great love. And so we need to put our arms as father around our children, as somebody said last night, and give them the certain of that love. Uh, Jacob did that to Joseph. And that's what made Joseph such a strong person. He knew he had his father's love. His father made him a coat of many colors so that they could know, he could know, and everybody could know that this is the boy that I so deeply love. It pays off. It pays off. Now y'all know the rest of the story, don't you? Y'all know the rest of the story. Y'all know that he, uh, his brothers end up selling him down into Egypt. That didn't make any difference. Because they sold him down into Egypt, they sold him to one of the governors, one of the uh, uh, pharaoh's aides, and he got in that house and he took over the house. I mean, he made that guy rich. And you know, the wife in there, she looked at him, and she could see the character in him. The ease, the way he gave orders, the way he affirmed the dignity of the people he worked with. And everybody around him loved him. He wasn't a bossy guy. And she looked at him, and she could see it. And she got, she wanted, she got jealous. And she wanted to have sex with him. And he wouldn't do it. 
and you know she streamed that she was raped and then you know he was thrown in prison that didn't make any difference that didn't make any difference they throw him in prison and just you would notice that read it carefully just in a few days he was managing the prison <laughs> <laughs> he had the keys to the prison and he was managing the prison and everywhere he went God was with him was with him yeah. and then in prison you know, y'all know the story there. Y'all, it's a kindergarten story. Y'all know the story in prison, how he had this vision, the dream. I mean, he always had a dream. But not only he have a dream, but he can interpret dreams. <laughs> he can interpret He knew what you was dreaming. <laughs> and, and so he could interpret dreams. And, you know, he interpreted his dream, and he ends up now with the Pharaoh. And when he got with the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh said, this, this man, Joseph, becomes the first Prime Minister. It was no such thing as a Prime Minister before Joseph. <laughs> Joseph was became the first Prime Minister of the most powerful country on earth. And so he became the Prime Minister. Y'all know that story, don't you? How he saved the whole society. And then when he come to his own brothers, he said, you brothers might have meant it for evil, but God was using me in order to save the world and to save the rest of you. And so a leader is a person with vision. Let me add a close here. My time is running out. What is my teaching is going to be this morning? Go to Psalm 1, and I'm going to go through Psalm 1, and we finish this morning. We're doing, we doing well here. Psalm 1. Psalm 1, then, is to show uh, this man, uh, 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 Joseph, to show clearly what produced him and what we want to be like. This is just a snapshot vision of this man, Joseph. And that's why I want you to go to Psalm 1 here to look at that and we'll be finished. Look what it says. And this is Joseph. Blessed is the man or the person that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here is a one who develops association and company with good people. Good people. If you want to be successful, you got to develop company with good people. You got to get good people around you. Look what it says. Blessed are the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, this is what that is what you shouldn't do. This is what you need to do in order to be successful, to be God's person. Look what it says here. Then it says. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, what he's saying is, his delight is in the word of God. If we're going to be Christian community developers, we got to delight in the word of God. We got to go to the word of God every day. We need to get our orders from the word of God. And we need to read the word of God to digest it first in our own life so that we can grow. But his delight is in the word of God. And in his word does he meditate day and night. And so we need to saturate our lives with the word of God day and night. And then we have then the results of that good leader. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Isn't that Joseph? Everywhere Joseph went, he prospered. Everywhere he went, Look what it says here. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruits in his season. His leaves also shall not wither, but whatsoever he do, he shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, not sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Look, there is a way that we can be successful. I preach a lot against this name it and claim it theology, this health and wealth theology. But let me tell you this, after saying that, that God has a plan of creative prosperity. Yeah. And that plan of creative prosperity is for us to be faithful to him and to the word of God. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg bread. And if we will walk 
humbly before the Lord. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that we need will be added. God has a plan of prosperity, but it's not a good luck plan. Amen. It's not a name and claim it plan. It's a plan of being diligent faithful, working hard, giving all you can to God's work, and saving all you can to send your kids to school. God have a plan of prosperity. And that plan is to use us to be diligent in doing the work that he calls us to do. Well, my time is gone.